a lot of the work that we do has been designed on the floor. It's been designed as we do it. We had a system going for a while where we had a, a day every two weeks. Everybody had a, a break from production work and um, they just do their own designs and stuff. And um, that worked quite well, really. You know, you, you could spend a lot more time over pieces and um, relax a lot more about it. Everybody's got to do a certain amount of work for the company, but I think for true glass making, you need to take time over it a bit more and consider it a bit more. Obviously, it's all in blue, but you get a great education in the outside line of form. That's where it, it really does have strength, and um, learning the blue completely, because you can't see through. Because in the glass world, a lot of it can go the other way, where the form isn't very good, but the colour technique is, is great. And it's harder to sell a piece like that. You know, I think um, if you can catch someone's eye with a shape, you've got more chance of selling it. You can see shapes through shapes. You can, you know, you're making one thing, but halfway through it, there's, there's another shape there that you could, you know, you could possibly do other things with and make another completely different vessel, you know, completely different piece. I think up, uh, applying handles and things is quite, I quite like that, it's quite fun. And it's, it's sort of right on the edge. It's like you make the piece and then you're putting a handle on it. It's like, I like the edginess of it. I like where it, where it goes to that line where, you know, it's make or break. But that's, I think that's probably my favorite part. It's exciting. A couple of you might decide to work on a little bit and just have a mess around just to relax. Because even working all day in production work sometimes can be quite stressful. And so at the end of the day, it's brilliant just to have a bit of a play and just not actually think about making anything, just let the piece make itself. I'm a firm believer in glass making itself. The less you touch it, the better. Glass itself seems to want to form itself into a particular shape, um, and you just sort of help it along, really. The tools haven't changed for 2,000 years. The blowing irons are exactly the same. In fact, if you looked into a a Roman workshop, the glass would be worked in exactly the same way as, as we work it, apart from the fact that we have gas and, and they had wood-fired furnaces. We didn't copy the original Bristol blue forms because basically the glass is so close, we could make it so close. It was fairly rough and ready when they first made it. If we did it rough and ready now, I mean, basically you get people passing the stuff off as antiques. Um, so we decided to keep away from the original Bristol blue and we've gone to sort of classical forms, things like that. You get inspirations from all the historical glass. Roman glass is really excellent. I mean, it's gorgeous stuff. The Islamic glass from the sort of medieval periods, like then there's a Venetian glass from the Renaissance glass, which is what I'm working on at the moment. Totally different style of glass making to the English glass. You can't sort of say, oh God, I'm a great designer. I've invented something new. You haven't because it's been done, you know, millions of times before over the last 2000 years. The glassmakers worked in brick-built cones about 80 to 100 feet high, which had a large central furnace fed by air from underneath and fired on coal. There were archways all around the base of the cone. The reason they were built in the form of a cone was that once the furnaces were fired up, the upper brickwork would get tremendously hot and there'd be a huge updraft formed through the cone and that updraft would enable them to get the furnaces up to the temperature they needed, 12 or 1300 degrees. The skyline of Bristol would have been dotted with these huge towers back in the 1750s. And in fact, there's a possibility of establishing a proper museum of glass making in Bristol contained within one of the cone forms. Uh, Bristol City Council and the SS Great Britain approached us to put one of these up. Well, the museum would consist of a working environment where international glassblowers can come and show off their skills, where we can train people. 200 years ago, uh, glassblowers were brought in from all over Europe, and I'd very much like to see all this happen again. It's not that it's a, a repetition of history, but I think the modern movement should be this centre of excellence in Bristol, where international glass blowers come to Bristol to show off their skills and exhibit their craft. The Bristol glass now is, I think it's quite sharp at the moment. <laughs> so, we've actually had sort of customers come and say to us, it's too sharp, it's, it's, it doesn't look handmade. But I just think that's just something that is good. We've got very good makers working for us now. Started off um, in Plymouth College of Art, where I've been, where I studied 
ceramics for about four years. And at the end of that four years, we had a module on glass, and it sort of sort of twigged and became really. It was very important to me that I had to carry on working in that material. It's a very fluid material, and instead of it being sort of oh okay, I'll do this. It's more of a passion, and you want to do it, and you need to continue it. Something about it being fluid. I mean, I love the water. I love sailing, windsurfing, anything like that. And with the liquid material, it was it seemed to gel really. In my fifth year now, and uh, in the glass working world, you know, five years is about on the floor is probably a fairly good apprenticeship really to get yourself into gear to have the skills, and um, well then you start becoming a, a real glass maker really. And um, yeah, so about five years I've been doing it now, and uh, still masses to learn. I'll never do it in my lifetime, but <laughs> I think the immediacy of it all, the, the immediacy and the having to sort of have the skills there and then on the moment to finish anything, really, and uh, making beautiful things. And just the whole scope of what you could do with it, having a skill in your hands, you'd be able to take, take it anywhere. You know, it's, it's the glass is the important bit, and getting, having the chance to earn money while you're working in it is brilliant. You can combine. You know, combine both things. A lot of people go through life going to work just purely for the money. And if you can go to work for the enjoyment as well, it's much better. It's the next thing that I'm going to do. It's got to be my favourite things to do. I mean, as long as I can actually get into the studio and make stuff, I don't care what it is. Glass is there in front of my eyes within 20 or 30 minutes. And I can express myself as an artist quite quickly and go on to the next piece. So although they appear to me as brief sketches, I'm always looking for the, for the one piece that really, really turns me on. And of course, I'll keep that for myself. In the future, I think we should sort of do a slightly crossover between the um, Venetian style and the English style to create something that's quite in individual and quite new. I think Bristol Blue has become popular in recent years for a number of reasons. A, it's a novelty again and uh, people want something different and it does look very good on the, on the table. Um, B, there's been a revival of interest in antiques generally, uh, I think largely fuelled by all the television programmes we've had in recent decades. Uh, but C, I think Bristol's woken up to the fact that it had something that made the name of Bristol renowned throughout the world.